No, no, that one, the laptop goes there. You see, you see nothing. So even even it's connected. I don't know. Yeah, no, the laptop is the laptop is showing via TV. That machine. Okay. But the um, but it's coming. But the Yeah, because it's not, there's no, there's no, on the, on the, on, on the desktop, there's no TV, so it can't be sharing from that. Now, okay, it's mine. Now I'm not sharing. Exactly. Yeah, so now, okay, I start sharing, just a moment. I start sharing, yes, sir. Yeah, and uh, then, oh yeah. On your laptop. Magic. It works. Well done, Sasha. Not Thank me, you. not me. <laughs> okay, so, so it's, uh, it's, it's, that, it's that, that one, yes. Okay. It's that one, okay. Very good. So this is an outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about myself. I'm usually bring in some personal things. Can you see my? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to mention a sort of list of co-workers and I want to emphasize the way that I've been working not only with mathematicians but with engineers and uh, even at least one sedimentologist but other scientists as well and I'm going to go through some quirky things that I love and hate about uh, the job and my experience but mostly I'm going to emphasize the positives and things which I've learned and done which are still learning. Uh, we're going to do two pieces of mathematics together in some detail, which I've picked because they're more recreational mathematics than about the, the home job. And we're going to do some geometry and something on convergence that I thought would appeal to a general audience. And there's a little bit at the end, again, uh, by way of entertainment, which is all about heptagons, a much neglected I can do the regular polygon. And just to intrigue you about what's coming up at the end of the talk, I'm just going to show you this, which I made out of Meccano yesterday. Uh, all of the pieces in this Meccano, there are seven pieces which are identical, they're bolted together, and they make rather a pretty shape. And I'm going to show you how this is connected to the regular heptagon. And by way of doing that, I'm going to bring in some history of maths as well. But that's for later. Um, for the next slide. Oh, that's, uh, tell me, next slide. And next I can slide. Too. Thank you, yeah. Sasha. Yeah. Uh, a bit about me. I'm sorry there's so much about this, but uh, let me take you back to my school days. Briefly, I went to school in my hometown of Maidstone, which is the county town of Kent, 50 miles southeast of London. And uh, Maidstone Grammar School uh, is and was very strong in the sciences and mathematics. But up to the age of 16, while I was there, I was more interested in art and history. And I still am interested in art and history. But the mathematics department uh, was particularly strong. And I did double maths, that's pure maths and applied maths and physics for my A-levels. And then I had a gap between school and university when I was employed by my old school to be their physics laboratory technician. And I was in Clover because I was making models and equipment and helping them to host 160 A-level students taking their A-level exams just a year after I'd taken it myself. After that, which was a very good experience, I went to Oxford to do my BA and my MSc in maths. And the MSc, I understand, is still going. It's in mathematical modeling and numerical analysis. And after Oxford, I was a poor student. Uh, I wanted to break away and earn some money. So I went to Peterborough to work for Perkins Engines, a diesel manufacturer. And they, I, I worked for them for almost exactly a year on uh, with mechanical engineers. And they were specialists in, in, in internal combustion, heat transfer. And I worked in a section called Predictive Methods, which is a name I still like. Uh, they were doing exactly that, and I, I computed uh, and, and wrote programs in Fortran to help engineers. The experience was very good for me, and I did this academia. I then went to Bristol for six years to do my PhD. I was employed as a, a, a research associate there with Hal Peregrine. The whole six years, including two years of postdoc, he and I worked together on various things. I'm sorry if it's a bit blurry and dense here, but a quick list of things I did for my PhD were 
computing unsteady water waves using exact equations that highly accurately approximate it on computer. So we were following a free surface and uh, looking at nonlinear full equations for tracking free surface motion. And uh, that was using a boundary integral method, which was founded by John Dold. Some people call him Bill Dold, and he is a specialist in combustion, but he did a year working in uh, water wave theory and fantastic work that he did. Overturning waves, waves breaking backwards, was something I found in my thesis work, and we confirmed some of the computations with measurements that we did in collaboration with Santander University. So it was a very nice trip to Spain to meet uh, people there and people working on it. Thank you, Sasha. And one of the things that came out of the work that I was doing in my postdoc was a thing called pressure impulse theory, which I'm going to mention a little bit later on. And uh, this is an engineering tool, a mathematical tool that engineers can use to help predict forces and pressures on seawalls and realistic structures. I have three slides in uh, people that I name who I've worked with in a substantial way, and uh, I'm just going to skim over the top of this. Brian Law of Perkins Engines was a big influence on me about how much you work and how much you get out of your work. A very wise man. Al Peregrine, I worked with for six years, much beloved and much missed because he died in 2007, still with a lot of research in him. Cesar Vettel was a primary person I collaborated with to do experiments in Santander in the solitary wave tank. Uh, Patrick Weidman did work with me very soon after I came to UEA, and he and I worked on the problem of a, a wave, a solitary wave, coming towards a vertical wall. The wave goes up the wall and it comes back down again. And the mechanics that we followed in, in that led to a very nice publication, very good collaboration uh, experiments, two sets of computations and everything came together very nicely. We worked it for very high amplitude waves where the nonlinear effects are really important. We quantified that in that work. Patrick was also a very good influence on me and in my interest in sloshing. He'd already got a, a, a long interest in waves which are moving inside containers. We've already done work on moving containers as well. So wave and structure interaction, container interactions are something else that I've worked on quite a lot. Simon Cox was my first PhD student. He gets a mention because he's now very senior at Aberystwyth University, and uh, it's been very nice to see his career blossom since he left here. He's a very good PhD student. And he worked with me on pressure impulse theory for his thesis. Gerald Muller and I shared a long collaborative piece of work. He was at Belfast, he's now at Southampton. Another engineer is Tom Bruce up at Edinburgh. He is a mechanical engineering, but he works a lot in water waves. I've worked very happily with him over the years. And I have another slide of thanks. Jan Alexander locally in M, a shared PhD supervision with her, and it's been wonderful sharing conversations about fluid mechanical problems as they really are in nature. Boulder motion, difficult areas where some modeling needs to be started to understand bed sediment motion, hydraulic jumps, and boulder motion I, I mentioned again, and areas of active interest. Adrian Matthews here, I, I'm a very happy collaboration with our shared PhD student on Adrian's project, and Peter Hicks turned out to be a fabulous student who's now at uh, Aberdeen, if I remember that rightly, as a lecturer, and uh, he, he did work on porous hot flows of water and air near volcanoes. Um, hello, Frank. <laughs> Sasha, needs no introduction. I, I knew him as Sasha said a long time ago. It was wonderful when he came to our department so that we could share ever more interesting impact. And uh, Alan Tassa uh, came as our postdoc, came for a couple of years, and he's now back in Brest, working there, again on the impact of other free surface flows. Gavin Morton gets a mention because he's a PhD student who's just finished his. PhD project, uh, and uh, Richard and I shared uh, very happy supervisions with him, working on a rather different area of impact where droplets are landing on a, a surface, either a plate or a porous substrate. Nobody's done this before. It's wonderful that Gavin was able to compute and analyze those sorts of flows, which are relevant to the inkjet industry, printing, and other areas. Yanis came as a visitor a few years ago and Sasha and I hosted him for a very productive work on impact in three-dimensional structures. Thank you. And I think I have one more slide here. Uh, Hussein Zekri, very nice to be able to continue his PhD work with Sasha and I. Um, and he's working at, at, 
on uh, liquid natural gas for his thesis, and his interest in the influence of gravity on splashes, jets, continues. So the short version of this is, think about what happens if you spill your coffee so badly that the coffee hits the ceiling. How does the coffee get off the ceiling and drip down on top of it? I mean, that's happening all the time inside a liquid natural gas tank. I want to mention in math projects, you know, I don't want to steal the thunder of a lot of students who've worked with me. And I've benefited from my research work to be able to think up projects for the vulnerable students to do. So ducks and drakes is one example of impact type problem where a stone is being skipped over the surface of water and it can do multiple bounces. Other areas that have come out of my research, which has been nice to have students work on, are singing or uh, musical bubbles, liquid sloshing in moving containers, and it, from the history, Archimedes' Spiral, a much neglected book of Archimedes' work, which has a lot of really very general and interesting work in it, and craters on the moon and other places. Even the internships are being given credit here. And it's been very nice to share with colleagues here, looking after intern uh, internships and students. Most recently, Paul and I shared work with Shannon Jones and Martha Smith, undergraduates, who have helped Paul in particular with future teaching work and preparation for students who are coming from school to the university. Well, that jump is something that uh, they have helped us to bridge. And everyone else I've worked with, too humorous to mention. Yep. Other lessons still learning. So I'm moving on a bit now. And I'm going to share with you some other things. I hope this will resonate with anyone doing research. Never assume, and if you're in collaboration, it may be that it's your co-worker who already has made that assumption. So it's good to go back and look at that again. Number two on my list is the term is only small when measured relative to terms in your working model. And it takes a lot of discipline to go back and check that you have an answer such that the model equations contain truly small quantities compared with the ones that you're including in the model. And it takes a lot of effort to do it. And uh, it's, it's a hard lesson to learn. Somebody else said this, and it's uh, stuck in my memory. To neglect a term is different from it being negligible. Often people mm -hmm. mix those two things up. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a lot of experience with working with people from industry who bring problems that are not very well defined. They want to meet a mathematician who can spray some equations over them. And of course, it's not like that. It's very hard work. And it boils down to, well, we've been sitting in this room for three days trying to understand the industrial problem. What is the question? What is it that you want to know? And even if you knew what the question was and had an answer to it, what would you do with the answer once you had it? And that's a good thing to think about. Well, why are you doing the work? And what kind of a model do you want? Do you want something that's singing and dancing partial differential equations? Or is it that a nice little piece of geometry will actually give the company what it is that they're asking us to do? Our fifth lesson is the hardest of all, I think, which is to listen to others. Two weeks ago, I was listening to the radio. This wonderful series, The Life Scientific. They interviewed Hannah Fry, a mathematician, and she quoted her friend Matt Parker, another famous mathematician, who said this, the key difference between mathematicians and non-mathematicians is not that we find it easy, it's that we enjoy how hard it is. I hope that resonates with people. It's very hard work doing research, but it's very enjoyable once you get the answer. Right, now this is the one slide that has some fluid mechanics on it, so bear with me if you're not interested in fluid mechanics, but I can claim to have worked in or thought about all six variants this slide. So all I've done is present in this equation one, the full form of Bernoulli's equation for an inviscid flow with an irritational velocity field, and we're going to assume it's incompressible. There are various terms, there are four main ones in this equation, and the most simple model that you have for a fluid is one where there is no flow, where it's just gravity and pressure. And in that circumstance, the uh, hydrostatic term rho g y, that's what I call number three, here, balances exactly the pressure term number four. It may be that the, the constant is coming in as well, but principally it's three and four as variables which are balanced. Number two is time independent steady flows, like in many textbooks, where if you neglect the gravi gravity, neglects gravity or it is negligible, one or the other, then the term number two and term number four 
will uh, balance each, each other. So for colliding jets, for instance, in a steady situation, the nonlinear terms number two will balance the pressure. And the third version is textbook second year hydrodynamics, where we start to look at the model of water waves on the surface of water with gravity. And there you build up a theory where term number one, which is the time dependent term, it represents the inertia of the fluid, is balancing the, uh, the um, hydrostatic term, rho gy, and the pressure term. So we have some balance between number one and number three, and four is sort of in incidental to that problem. And you're living in the hope that the wave amplitude is small enough compared with the wave length that we can neglect the nonlinear term. Having a linear theory is, of course, fabulous because you have so many techniques for solving linear problems. Number four, the kind of work I was doing for my PhD, which other people have worked on around the world, is trying to make some sense of the nonlinear terms when you have steep waves where the height of the wave is appreciable compared with the length of the wave, and you can no longer neglect this term number two with the nonlinearity. And, and then you, you begin to think, well, maybe I need all four terms. In here. Maybe there are no approximations. Perhaps I just need a lot of computing power to describe an overturning wave, and you do. One, two, three, and four are really present in nonlinear waves, and particularly braking and other, other types of uh, motion for large amplitude waves. Recently, uh, I was looking at some work where water starts from rest. You just have a pile of water. And you let it go under gravity. What's the early stage of the motion of the flow? And if it's starting from rest, then the nonlinear terms are going to be small for small times. And what you find as a balance is that the gravity is accelerating the flow, the equation. Term number one is describing the acceleration of the flow. And you have a linear theory balancing one and three. And with the help of number four, it helps you to find some boundary data on the free surface where the pressure is zero. So you then have a linear boundary value problem for Laplace's equation for the acceleration term. And then you can work everything out, at least for the early stages of flow. It seems a bit special, you know, short time, but it's really essential for understanding what's happening with waves which are standing. That is, standing waves where the maximum or minimum of the wave is sitting in one place and the wave has reached the maximum. What shape does the free surface have? And what's it doing at the time of maximum height? So that's five out of my six claims to have I've worked in these areas. The sixth one is violent flow in general where again we're, we're neglecting the nonlinear terms number two and under those circumstances it's number one and number four which balance each other. Flow is entirely inertial. When the wave comes in and strikes a seawall, everything is very high acceleration, very short time scale, number one and number four balance each other. It's a nice linear theory for describing a really violent type of motion. So that's one to six. Next. That's it. Thank you, Sasha, for the next slide. Okay. Since we're running a bit short, I'll skip over this one. Thank you. It takes a bit of explaining. It's not... We're going to do some mathematics together now. So this is uh, some recreational mathematics that's about 150 years old. And uh, I'll try and explain it with the help of this prop here. At the top of the slide is a stick, and on it there is a marked point. And the distances from the marked points to the two endpoints are called P and Q. And the game goes like this. I take the stick and I put it onto a curve. And the curve is, when it's complete, is a simple closed convex curve. And the stick is here, I've marked it in red. There's a, a, a marked point here and the two endpoints both lie on the convex curve. The convex curve could be anything you like, something drawn as the stick is allowed to move, with this point A staying on the curve and the point B staying on the same curve, then the point M, it moves across the plane and it has a locus, which I've drawn in red in here, and it forms a closed curve, which is inside the given curve, C1. So called C, the one that's drawn by point M, and C1 is the original curve that we started off with. Holditch's theorem says that the shaded area between the two curves is pi times p times q. When I first saw this in David Wells' book on geometry, I was astounded 
So where, where in this formula is there something about the shape of the curve C1? There's nothing. There's no information about the curve at all. It can be any shape you like. But why is it that pi PQ only depends upon the two distances on the stick and the factor pi? Why is this so simple when it, this could be a very complicated shape? Thank you. On the next slide, I've got some technical things about the proof just to set it up. And what I have on here is a formal statement, better than original, originally stated by Holovich in 1858. It's a one page paper, and I never did understand the proof that he presents. So I'm going to present to you something that I hope will be a bit more convincing. And the things to carry with you in this proof are the P and the Q, and the fact that P plus Q is equal to the length of the stick. So we'll have a proof now. Thank you. On the next slide, so we'll skip over this one to the proof. I, I must be a mathematician if I'm proving something. So <laughs> I hope this will come out uh, uh, to you in a convincing way. Now, the clever thing that, that's not my idea, but the clever thing I picked up from reading around the subject is that the ideal parameter to use in this proof is to just to take the angular valuation of the stick, which I call T here, and assuming we can get all the way around the curve with one rotation then the angle T is going to lie between zero and two pi. That will be a successful completion of this motion. And a, li a nice formula that maybe should be better known is that if a point A is described by uh, coordinates X and Y, both of which are parametrically given as functions of T, then this formula here will give you the signed area for the locus A going around the circuit. So it's integral with respect to T for not to two pi. Mustn't forget the factor of a half. And the dashes in this formula, they're just t derivatives. So it's not just the integral of y dx, but we're being more sophisticated because we've got a closed curve. Here. And uh, I explain here that uh, you can get plus or minus the area depending on which way round the curve you go. So it's kind of nice that you get this. But the square bracket notation just means the signed area described by the point that's inside the brackets. There. So we have already an expression for A, which is one end of the stick in this formula here. What about an expression for the motion of the point M and the other curve? Well, we can use this formula again, but with coordinates for M suitably chosen. And the coordinates for M are going to be the endpoints X and Y, but with correction. So to go along the stick of distance P when it's elevated at this angle T, we just need to go to x plus p cos t, and the y acts y plus, a correction, y sine t. So we're at the right place at the right distance p from the point a. I've got that right way around. So here I've substituted in from the previous formula the same thing, but now for the signed area m, and we have some things to work out here. So in the next slide, we're going to multiply out the brackets and simplify, and then we'll be almost home. Can I have the next slide, please? When we do that, we have this integral, first integral on the right is going to be the signed area for A, so that's fine. We have a nasty integral here involving y and x uh, dashed and cos t and sine t. We don't ever need to worry about this because it's a constant. It only depends upon, it's an integral with respect to t, not to 2 pi. It does not depend upon p. It's just multiplying p here. There's a quadratic term in p, and this is an integral that I think everyone can do. Plus squared plus sine squared is 1. So this integral would be 2 pi. When we divide by 2, we we'll have pi p squared as the last term. I've tried to reassure you already that we don't need to worry about this nasty integral up here. If we rewrite that nasty integral as just k, a constant, then we can see that this is an expression for m, which is just a quadratic in p. There isn't any more. There's no approximation here. This is exact. And it's true for p taking any value between 0 and l. So how can we find out k? We can do it just by putting p equal to l. In other words, we can put the point m on the stick all the way up to the other end at point b. So I'll do that and uh, yes, uh, eliminate k, let p equal to l, and then m is at b, and the area enclosed by b is from the equation one, the secondary equation number two. So we have the relationship between b and a and this. So on the next slide, I'm actually eliminating K. Thank you, Sasha. Which is a linear combination of A and B after tidying it up. Uh, and uh, well, we now have a description of M in terms of A and B, and then these quadratic terms with P. Okay. 
Remember, L is the length of the stick, it's P plus Q. And now we're ready to say something about these signed areas for A and B. Of course, they're going, both of them are sitting on the curve C1, the one that's originally going. So as we go around, the signed area for A and the signed area for B, they're the same. That's nice. If we rearrange this formula number three, then we can put it in the form of the area of the curve C1 minus the area of C. So that's what I have on the left-hand side. That's A minus M in square brackets. And on the right-hand side, look at this. It's just quadratic in P. And the pi P squares, they cancel. And we're left with the punchline pi P Q. That's all it comes down to. The area between the curves C1 and C is just pi P Q. There's no information in this proof about the shape of C1 and nothing in the formula at the end. Now, isn't that a nice result? And this is 150 years old. QED, we got that. So this is all old hats. This is being proved by other people. But I was delighted to be able to retrace the tracks. And then it set me thinking. So this is the researcher thinking about a recreational problem. And this is an extension of old issues theory, which did lead to a paper in Mathematical Gazette. So I hope it will entertain you. So instead of just C1 being one closed curve, now think about a single arc C1. And here I've drawn it in black from top to bottom of the curve. C1 is a curve on which the end point A sits. It's not allowed to leave the curve C1. Same for this second curve, C2, that goes left to right across the page. The other end point of the stick B is only allowed to stay on C2. So there are no closed curves here for C1 and C2. They're separate. And pretty much you can draw them however you like. I don't mind. Meanwhile, while you have A on C1 and B on C2, we move the stick like we did before so that the stick ultimately rotates. And I've shown a few in black, or red rather, of the positions of this stick as it goes around. And while it's moving, of course, the fixed point on the stick is also moving. And interestingly, it goes clockwise around this red curve here while the stick is going anticlockwise. I hope I said that right, because um, it's easy to get them mixed up. Yes, the stick goes anticlockwise, the point M goes clockwise. And the punchline for this extension of the theorem of Holditch is that the area enclosed by the circuit C is equal to pi PQ. And the proof of this comes pretty much from everything that we've done already. Thank you. So we already had this equation three in the earlier proof which shows that the area enclosed by the motion of M is equal to a linear combination of A and B minus pi P Q. And if we have just arcs for A1 and uh, sorry, C1 and C2, then they're not enclosing any uh, area. They're just going backwards and forwards, these two points. So the area enclosed by A and B, they're both zero. So these first two terms in equation three give us zero. And what we're left with is the area enclosed by M is minus pi PQ. I should say that more carefully. The signed area of the motion of M is minus pi PQ. And the minus is because we've gone round clockwise instead of anticlockwise. But it's interesting, again, that it has no information about the shape of the curve C1 or the shape of the curve C2. Right, so I think I just have one more image to illustrate this extension. Uh, this is just by way of a few pictures. But what I've done here is to take C1 to be a straight line. It's the green line from left to right in the picture. And the C2, the other curve I've chosen, is an arc of a circle which has a center which is offset a little bit below the green line. And I've chosen a point which is about 80% along a stick in order to make an interesting shape. So I've got a linear and a quadratic description of C1 and C2. The red curve that's traced by M turns out to be a quartic, it's a quartic relationship between X and Y of an almost intractable type, but you can say some things about it. For instance, you can show that this apparently sharp corner up here has a small curvature, but not zero. It is not a sharp edge. And I chose this because it has a shape that's a little bit like a dolphin or a teardrop. And I quite liked it when it came up on the computer. I tried drawing these by hand, but it was hopeless. Uh, Maple came to the rescue. So I hope you found that piece of geometry amusing. Um, when I first came across it, I've never seen anything like it before. 
And I'm going to change topic a bit. And I thought this might also resonate with other mathematicians. We've all had cases where we had nice series coming out of our work, and we think we've got an answer, but the series turns out to be rather slowly converging. And I'm going to talk a bit about alternating series, because this is a technique that works especially well. Now, I'm, I'm describing all of this work in terms of series of constants, but the comments could equally apply to power series or Fourier series, where you have slow convergence. One of the first infinite series written down was by Leibniz in about 1670, and he had this series for pi, uh, which is equation one. Pi is four minus four over the, and then it's odd integers on the bottom, and it's an alternating series because the signs change minus plus minus plus, and it's very slowly convergent. And the further you get on the series, the more each term is like the previous term. But what you're doing, if you want to try and add up this series, is to add up a term and then subtract almost the same quantity. And then you're adding up almost the same quantity and then you subtract almost the same quantity. It's hopeless. You're just oscillating about uh, what you hope would be a value for pi or an estimate for pi. So one thing to do, it's been known a long time, is to just take the next term in the series and go halfway. So in this more complicated series where the terms are expensive to evaluate as well, I've got a few roots of the old numbers here on the bottom, why not just go to the half? I put it in bold here because these are weights which we'll see in the next slides. So the simplest thing to do is to do half, and that will gain you about one extra significant mm -hmm. digit compared with just brute force calculating lots of terms. And uh, what I'm doing now is presenting to you a more general view of, of alternating series, where I'm going to talk about the head and the tail. And the head is a finite number of terms from the series that you may be happy to compute. And then the tail, which is infinitely long, is the bit that you really want to approximate. And the approximation comes with the help of two operators, which have been known about in the textbooks for a long time. And uh, I'm going to stop at the point n in the series, and I'm going to assume that n is an even number, so that the next thing we do will be to add on a term or add on an approximation. And the two operators uh, I'll introduce here, there's one which gets you from one term to the next, that's the E operator, and then there's the delta operator, which is the difference between the current term and the next term. So if we have E operating on a n, then all it does is increase the index by one, and the delta operator, that gets you uh, looking at the difference between aj and uh, minus aj plus one. And they're related to each other, and little thought will persuade you that E is the identity operator minus the difference operator. So we can rewrite the series uh, in exact terms as a series which has a head, and then the second term, which has the E operator acting on the, the point where you want to start making an approximation. So these k's here, they are repeated operations using e, going from k equals zero to infinity. Now, uh, if we just walk straight into this, we might think, oh, that looks like a geometric series. I'll just sum it. And you'd be right. Because this operator here behaves exactly like a factor. So we can use the sum of a geometric series to sum this operator acting on a n. And here it is, it's one over one plus e, well, one over the identity plus e in operator language. And this minus one power is not really one over, it's the inverse of i plus e, formally speaking. But the steps to prove this are exactly the same as the steps you prove for the sum of the geometric series. So it's acting on a n. Now, this is where delta comes back in again because we can replace e by the identity minus delta. So on the next slide, we'll use the delta operator instead of the e operator. I think we jumped one the session. No. No. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we're good, thank you. Mm -hmm. So instead of the E operator, now I'm rewriting this in terms of delta, we have an extra factor half that I've taken outside, so that we have the identity minus half of delta, and it's the inverse of that operator, acting on A n. It looks like the sum of a geometric series with common factor minus a half, sorry, a half delta. So we can re-expand it as a geometric series. Cheeky, but it works, and you can make it rigorous. So here it is in equation eight, rewritten as a geometric series. And the bonus here is that you're picking up powers of a half. So that's bound to be helping you with the convergence. And what's more is that the deltas 
are going to be really small and acting on AN because it's the differences between successive terms which give you slow convergence. So this should be pretty good. Uh, just to interpret what the deltas mean, when they're acting on AN by itself, it's AN minus AN plus one. As we have uh, delta squared here, that will be the familiar AN minus two AN plus one plus AN plus two. So we, as we go to higher powers of delta, we'll have more terms from the tail of the series to include. So everything up until now is exact. We've not made any approximations to this infinite series, but now we have to truncate. We have to stop somewhere. So we're going to truncate these mean terms. And um, for every extra term you include, you're getting about one extra decimal place in your approximation. So why not, instead of just faffing around with one or two terms, go to a formula with 11 terms. Here you see 11 weights, ranging from a number which is very close to one times a n, something a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller. As we go through these 11 terms here, we are getting down to a very small value, one over two to the uh, 11 at the end of this, acting on a n plus 10. So the, the powers of a half and these other integers on top, they come from uh, differences of Bernoulli numbers from re expanding the delta powers and uh, these powers of a half as well. That's all they are. But what's nice is that the universal it doesn't depend upon the series. It could be anything. It could be a polynomial. It could be a bunch of constants, anything you like. You're almost guaranteed to have 10 digit accuracy in the answer that you get. So uh, let's go back to uh, the example of Leibniz's series at the end. And uh, thank you. Oh, that went back. Sorry. Uh, no, forwards. Forwards. Mm -hmm. Omnis. Let's go back to Leibniz's series. This has algebraic decay, order j to the minus one. So it's moderately slowly convergent. And uh, here it is again. And thought of as an approximation for pi, then you can work quite hard if you want to. The first thousand pound, that first thousand terms is going to give you 3.14059. 3.14 in bold there, because they're the only accurate decimal places. That's a lot of work to get something which is only marginally better than 22 over 7. You might as well use 22 over 7. So if you get 1,000 terms, much better to use uh, 22 over 7. So it's not very good at all. But with my formula, with 11 terms in it, and a truncation, uh, so I'm, uh, I should explain a bit, I'm taking 10 terms from Leibniz's series as the head, then I'm using my formula with the 11 weights of it for the next terms, and what do we get? We get this value here, where these are all accurate decimal places for value of pi, and we've got 10, I think it is then involved, and it's doing quite a good job of getting to the 11th decimal place in pi when we compare with the decimal expansion. I've presented this to you as just numbers, but I say again, it could be a power series or it could be a Fourier series that you're actually summing. And again, you're going to get higher accuracy using these weights. So just to compare with what you were doing earlier, if you add up a thousand terms in the series, that's a lot of work. Doing 5% of that work on your computer, you get 10 million times higher accuracy with this way of treating the series. Okay, so that's a bit about series. Thank you. Good. I think I've caught up some time now, so I can relax a bit. Uh, I want to come back now to one of my favorite topics in the last couple of years, which is about hexagons. So I hope to reach a point where I can explain this artifact. Now this picture, which is designed for coloring in books, has highlighted, I hope you can see this, in gold or yellow on the right hand side here, is a, a, a seven sided regular <coughs> heptagon. And all I've done is to take one vertex that's in the middle and rotate this heptagon about the center. And as I move it, I make 14 identical copies. So it's a regular pi by seven angle as we move it around. Every time we move it through that, we make a copy. The black lines here, they are just reproductions of these line segments in the heptagon. So all of the black and the yellow line segments in this picture have equal length. In this picture, all of the angles are multiples of pi by seven. And blow me, I can't find any examples online in the images on Google of something that looks like this. You may think of cathedral roses, but they will have either eight or 12 or 16 way 
symmetry about them. This has 14 way symmetry. Each of the heptagons that's in the pattern is contributing one edge to the 14 gon on the outside of the image. 14 gon, the tetradecagon. I think it should be called a fortnightagon or something like that. For Americans, a fortnight is two weeks. Thank you. So a bit of the background to this uh, is where I'm bringing in Archimedes and some history. Uh, Crockett Johnson, I think he was an American, was writing a nice paper in 1976, again in the Mathematical Gazette, and he had a matchstick construction for the hexagon, which is this. And he was sitting in Syracuse in a restaurant near where Archimedes lived when he came up with this idea. He had a bunch of matches on the table and the restaurant playing around them, and he realized that if you have a, a wedge with open, at an opening angle of pi by seven, then you can get matches of the same length to form this crisscross pattern and a last one, which is at the bottom there. And this pattern is nice because if you th think of these line segments as vectors, you can rearrange these vectors by sliding them across the plane, rearranging them to make a regular hexagon. And it's thought by historians that this might have been a noises construction, which you could have used to describe a regular hexagon. So in Archimedes day, it was already known that with a straight edge, not a ruler, a straight edge and compasses, you can make a regular triangle, square, pentagon and hexagon, but the heptagon is the first regular polygon that you cannot construct with a straight edge and compasses. And Archimedes already had a track record for bending the rules a little bit. For instance, trisecting any angle is a noises construction that Archimedes invented and was rightly famous for. So it is speculation about how Archimedes might have been interested in this, and uh, Crockett Johnson's paper is very interesting about that uh, matter. So this is just really a description of the pattern I showed you. The last picture of this is a coloured version of the same. And to show you the link again with the matchstick construction, I've highlighted the wedge on the right-hand side of the pattern. So between two yellow wedge lines going into the center, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven matchsticks which fit into this wedge, an angle of pi on seven, and that's exactly this artifact which I'm showing in my hand here. Mm -hmm. um, what I've tried to do is to give each of the hexagons a different color, but I failed because the machine, of course, puts colors on top of colors <laughs> on top of colors. Um, if you stare at this too long, then it, it does my head in. Uh, because it's full of necker cubes. It's got hexagons in it, yeah. which are the outlines of images of cubes, which as Necker famously introduced into the world, images which can be interpreted as the interior of a room, a uh, corner, you know, the skirting boards and the line up wall, or you can interpret it as looking at the outside of a cube. And these two interpretations flick backwards and forwards in your mind. So it's, a, it's an interesting example of what your heads can be suffering when it's not able to interpret an image. And there are 14 of these Necker cubes in here at slightly different angles. And uh, I wouldn't like to meet this on a dark night. <laughs> Thank you. Next. Uh, yeah. What more do we have? Well, I don't really have any major conclusion, but just to run over the things we've uh, talked about today, I, I, I wanted to spend time talking about thanking my co-workers, and I hope I've done that uh, at least partly today. I've covered some pet hates and favourites in passing. Uh, personally, I've had a very satisfying and happy career at the mathematics at UEAD, and I, I'm really grateful to colleagues who helped me to do that. Uh, we've looked at a couple of pieces of mathematics, and I've even proved some things in front of you today. One about uh, geometry and whole digits theorem, and the other one about alternate series. And uh, having a long interest in teaching and reading about the history of maths, I'm really convinced that. There are things there which have yet to be rediscovered, and that it is a wonderful subject to look back on. But all of these things help to make our subjects so rich, and diverse, and growing all the time. And I'm leaving mathematics now at a time when I think that worldwide, mathematics is beginning to be really appreciated. So, for particularly younger mathematicians, I, I hope that you will have a very nice career in front of you. So, good luck with your own creative efforts. Creative efforts are highlighted there. It's being important. And that's it. Thank you.
wish you big time of thing. Thank you. For, for anything, anything about anything. Just a uh, little comment. Uh, um, Mark, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Um, I should. I, I should say that. Um, just a small comment. Mark said uh, he is uh, leaving mathematics. I don't think it's possible. So it will be always with him, and uh, particularly we have some plans. Uh, so to continue, so Mark leaves no path on me, <laughs> so he <laughs> couldn't <laughs> escape. <laughs> and, uh, now he can use emails. <laughs> we will visit each other as well. Yes, <laughs> yes, and. Uh, I believe she is very much welcome uh, in the school. But, uh, I don't know how it's uh, his offices now. Probably retired. Uh, and this is how I can. So anything, anything which is not related. Question from Tom Ward. There's more in the ah. what, what, what was the Nikano model? Ah, okay. You. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, David. <laughs> You can follow the chat, right? Stay. Uh, anything it's else in the chat? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see better now, Tom? Yep. Thank you. Grand. So this is the, this is the uh, construction in the wedge. Ah, I got it. Beautiful. So you've got a set of Meccano in your office, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you. Ah, it's not muted. It's uh, it's uh, um it's not mm, just a moment. It's a pro it's a problem. It's a no. It's one hundred. No, it's a uh, uh, it's, it's not okay. Um, anybody else? I can, uh, see, uh, I, can, I can see one, but it looks like the smaller things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now it's smaller thing because it, I, I left. Uh, um, they might not be on this conversation yet. They might not be. Mm -hmm. no, 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 Tricep, it's called a three seater. And then you put a semicircular arc of a certain radius, and then uh, uh -huh. you want to achieve the noises by adjusting your distance R on your straight edge. So that the straight edge has this property that that distance and that distance are the same as this distance. Not that one. Now, this is R, R, and R is over there. And um, let's see, P, Q, R, they are in a straight line. But you can't do that with a straight edge alone. You need a sense of distance on the straight edge to be able to do it. And this is Archimedes' construction, and that's the theta. So this is a, a noises construction, which I think is transliterated that way. Well, I have a question. 
say that you've had a very satisfying career, is there one thing that you can isolate as being the thing that's brought you most satisfaction over your years of research and teaching? Well, definitely talking with colleagues and students, definitely spending time puzzling over problems, thinking about things, sometimes intractable problems, but sharing. Uh, sharing, that's the short answer, definitely, yeah. Sorry, it's a bit short. No, 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 that's <laughs> good and from the heart. I love it. Um, you're thinking about the technical thing, if I may. So in the, in the series that you had for Pi, the, the 10 terms at the beginning and then the 11 the tail, 10, 10 is almost the same as 11. Is that deliberate and is that a general thing that you just take the same number? No. The head doesn't really matter. You could reduce the 10 down to one or two terms. It's the tail that really matters. Uh, it's a good point. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I didn't want to show off too much because uh, it's a very good formula for the tail approximation. But it turns out that it's so good that you don't need much from the head, especially when it's slowly converging. Uh, is it only for uh, alternating series, or it could be generalized, you know, to uh, uh, other uh, for the convergent series that you view? Sadly, this only seems to work for alternating uh -huh. series, but I'm sure that there are problems which can be turned into alternating series, and it's worth the effort because of the benefits you have from this theory. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's known, it has been known about for about 100 years, mm -hmm. and it was in textbooks mm -hmm. around about 1900. But only for very low order approximations, one, two, three terms. And I tried to really look back at the literature of this. Nobody had really stretched it. And to get those weights, of course, I needed Maple to help me to do it. And it took a lot of checking to get it right. But once you've done it, you just do it. You know, use, use those same weights. Very beautiful, beautiful. There. There. Uh, Thank you very much. My mathematics is, <laughs> it, it could be uh, um, uh, not everybody share this uh, opinion, but we, I think that mathematician should be lazy, very lazy. If he is active, you know, working hard, running quickly, no chance to get a nice shortcut and it's a beautiful solution. And this is beautiful solutions which are valuable. If your result is beautiful, it's right. If you spend weeks, you know, to get your solution, and then it's awful and difficult to explain, something is wrong. You are still part of the solution. And uh, what uh, uh, Mark showed today is a very nice illustration of uh, uh, this, uh, this idea. So it's good to be lazy. Not in the uh, first, second year, but later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark, very much. Thank you. And uh, this is not the end of, of, uh, of our uh, seminars. So we're starting from, as I remember, 8th of November. All other seminars uh, will be given by uh, colleagues, uh, st uh, former students and uh, uh, friends of uh, 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 Mark, uh, so they were invited especially to commemorate uh, that uh, um, event in uh, Mark's life. Uh, it's um, difficult for me to pronounce retirement because we, I'm not very much believing it. <laughs> so the um, yeah. So yeah. So thank you very much, and uh, then we close. Uh, our seminar. There could be questions uh, uh, from the online the participants. Uh, I will forward this question to Mark to answer and directly to the uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 <laughs> Mark, <laughs> please make like this. <laughs> that was fun. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, first time, um, and hope it will it be better. Yeah. So thank you very much, and we are yeah, stopping recording. Wow. Yeah.